Welcome to Theo Trade. This is Don Kaufman. It's December 16th, 2022. We are just seconds after the cash close here on this Friday afternoon. It's option expiration. It's triple witching. And yet, it is much quieter than I would have anticipated. All right, here we are doing the weekend update. Our market saying something about a recession. Let's just jump right into it. A very brief week in review. So today's trading session, spoos are down some 53 handles. And as I indicated a moment ago, it's a lot quieter. Now, we had heard that Citadel, the market maker, had some pretty significant technology issues early on in the trading session. And the reason I want to bring this up is because typically on an OPEX like this, OPEX is option expiration, right after the opening bell, like you would see some raging, raging size come through the S&P futures, especially where like in the overnight session, we were down. Look at this. And you got like, you know, 2,700 contracts trading a minute. For those of you that do not speak contract size and geek, that is incredibly light. <laughs> I mean, 5,000 contracts a minute is some decent kind of pumping volume. Hey, look, net, net, including some of the overnight trade, all the rolls, all the OPEX, we're going to do about 1.8 million contracts. And just to compare that, and again, I like to compare and contrast, just to compare that to some of the recent trading sessions, what do you got? Absolutely nothing. Had you told me, like, if I didn't know that this was options expiration and I just looked at the volume, I never would have been able to tell. So is that a tell unto itself? And this is where everybody goes, it's a holiday, it's this. Listen, none of that matters, okay? Maybe the fact that Citadel was down for a portion of today, that does matter. And I'll tell you why it matters, because no one's slinging at Citadel, you know, S&P contracts when their technology is down. And they are responsible for a massive amount, massive amount of uh, futures contract trading because they're trying to hedge off some of their deltas. Nevertheless, volume, okay, light. And I'll tell you, I was trying to fill some trades today. A rough go, a really rough go. In fact, one of the trades I tried to fill was inside of Tesla, which we'll talk about over here, okay? Order got canceled. I am bummed out. All right, let's, uh, as I said, kind of get down to business the week in review. So it is uh, nothing less than, well, once again, Mr. Toad's wild ride inside of this marketplace. We're going to go to the SPX, the mother of all products. You know, if you stepped back from the week, you're like, we were down massively. <laughs> really? Were we? I mean, the first thing I want to bring up is the week, okay, by and large was looking for a $127 move. And that's actually highlighted right here, $127 move inside of the SPX, the mother of all products. So in the SPX, what did we do? Well, for the most part, all right, the market started off the week in a very positive note. We exploded to the upside in CPI only to reverse back down. When I say exploded to the upside, hey, look, we're looking for a $127 move all week. We had, you know, a $160 move up. Okay, then we actually fell. But net, net, what did we really lose on the week? And that's when I talk about like a week in review, like, hey, look, you know, I'm not going to give you like it's Mac Deeds, a Fibonacci. Okay, that's not what we're about here. Look, we started the week at somewhere around 39, 33 in the S&Ps. We're going to close it right around 38.50. It's not that bad. Come on. What's, you know, 80 S&P points amongst friends? And the answer is not that much. The losses are not as great as people anticipated. If you look at the QQQ, and we actually do want to bring up the Qs for just a moment, cruise over here to auto expected moves. What do we have in terms of auto expected moves? Okay, this just kind of delineates how significant the move happened to be. In the uh, NASDAQ, though, we did in fact cross outside the edge and closed pretty much on the lower edge of the uh, expected move in there. But the NASDAQ overall, the volatility was just uncanny. It was explosive to the upside, explosive to the downside. Net net though, the NASDAQ was uh, quite a bit lower, obviously on some of the price actions, specifically inside of Tesla. I'll talk a little bit more about Tesla, which is uh, all, -time, uh, all time new lows. Well, this year anyway, I would like to think it was all time lows, but uh, no, I mean, you can go back over here. This is a major breach somewhere around the 150 handle though, which is exactly where we're trading. Uh, it does appear to be some degree of support. Okay. So cause of obviously of a lot of the volatility in the week, I'm actually going to go to a 30 day one hour was the uh, CPI and Fed. Now by this time, by Friday afternoon, talking about the CPI and the Fed, listen, it's over. <laughs> you don't need to hear any more about CPI. 
that was maybe a little softer than anticipated, meaning inflation might be easing, okay? We don't need to talk anymore about the Fed. It just doesn't matter. Even opinions, it doesn't matter. It's all playing out in the order flow. Initially, CPI, very, very positive for the market. The market faded back. That meant something. The Fed, they basically came out, and this is something that we uh, prefaced on Tuesday. I said, they're going to come out, and they're going to be hawkish. They're going to come out, and they're going to come out swinging. <laughs> they're basically just not going to come out of that hawkish stance for quite a period of time to put the, uh, the fear into the marketplace that inflation is going to be controlled. And um, that's it. And you know, here's, here's the reality of it, <clears throat> is that if you had the CPI, Okay. And, and I really want you to think about this because, you know, the, uh, the next bullet over here is what I call big, bad, binary movement. All right. Big, bad, and binary. These were binary moves, both CPI and Fed. When I say binary moves, they're coin flips, nothing more. And people, they, you know, they try to convince themselves of all kinds of things that are relevant. Like, no, it hit the exact number of 4180. Listen, it's a binary move. Uh, within a minute or two, we exploded to the upside. All right. So that, that coin came up heads, but we faded back on it, okay? And this is where I make the point, like even if you knew what the CPI was the day before, you probably still couldn't make very much money off of it because could you have justified that we're gonna explode higher and then come off huge? When I say explode higher, like, hey, listen, this is no joke here. We moved from 4050 to roughly almost 4200. You know, you have a 150 you know, plus point move in, uh, in one direction only to see it reverse in the hours thereafter. Okay. I mean, come on, just admit that, you know, again, these binary moves, they come. Then when it comes to the Fed, the initial knee jerk reaction of the Fed was actually positive before actually seeing some heavier sell side activity later in the day. And then we just kind of continue to slide on the week. I mean, that just breaks down the entire week. One thing we did actually find out though, and I thought that this was of critical importance is that our gravity point held throughout the roll. When I say the roll, there was a point in time, all right, let me actually cruise in here to the, uh, to the one minute all right, and I'm gonna have to use the 30 minute. There's actually a, a point right here, okay, where the futures contract rolled forward. And when I say it rolled forward, that dashed line over here is where we actually move forward, okay, into from, I should say, the DEES, okay, into the March contract. So, wait, I can clarify that. That's supposed to say DEES, and that's supposed to say March. Now, when we rolled forward, the gap in the roll was approximately 30 handles, except we had this critical level of 39.31. And I'm going to tell you what, I was not sure. It's been a long time since we've seen a roll, okay, that's that significant. And the reason behind the roll being that significant cost of carry has actually gone up, basically interest rates. Nevertheless, okay, what actually played an absolutely critical role, though, was 39.31 is still a gravity point even after the roll. And we questioned that. And we question it and continue to question it until all of a sudden, boom. I mean, there it is. And we uh, we even saw us breaking off the 39.31. And as we did, volume started to surge. You can see volume surges breaking off the 39.31, continuing to surge thereafter. I think that's one of the most critical aspects. The reason I bring that to your attention is we've got 42.11. We've got 39.31. If we actually open up a larger chart, I've got gravity points that haven't been seen in years. Okay, But we suspect that they're still actually going to hold weight okay, into the future. Now, the key is this, is it's not about the past. Again, in those binary moves. I believe that we're through a lot of the binary okay, kind of movement for the time being. And again, the binary movement just simply means, hey, all you have is the markets are a big pool of gasoline and every like you know data drop comes out is just rocking markets higher or lower. As I said, I believe we're actually through the biggest, the baddest of those. At this point, though, in time, you know, the big question I posed on this weekend update here, are markets saying something about a reception, uh, a recession? And the uh, the key to that is, have markets really priced in a recession? And it's, that's a question. I don't believe they have. And that's a, a purely an opinion piece. And the reason that I say that, I don't think that markets have priced in a recession, okay? I think they're starting to price in a recession. And the reason I say that is some of the data points that are coming out right now, weaker data points are actually causing more sell side in the markets. We even had PMI this morning, and a lot of people didn't catch this, but when PMI did come out, all right, initially it was a big, big candle here. By the way, PMI came in very, very soft, okay? It was a big candle over here. We rallied and then started fading heavily off of it. It was bad data, actually was bad to the marketplace. And it's, to me, a sign that, 
recession probability has gone through the roof over here. With that coupled with bonds, bonds have complete and utter confusion at this point. Okay. So if you're thinking about a recession, if you're thinking about a recession, all right, I would assume that the bonds, all right, would start to do what? Okay. Rally a little bit. If bonds rally, the rates, all right, that's actually like interest rates. For instance, if this rate was 3.5%, that that interest rate would actually subside just a little bit. By the way, the ZB is somewhere near 3.5% right now. And, okay, if the Fed was aggressive and everybody goes, no, you got it all wrong, Don, okay? If we're, if we're the Fed says they're going to raise rates, if the Fed says they're going to raise rates, then the interest rate, the percentage of the interest rate should go up. Well, that's not necessarily true. Interest rates, okay, at the ZB, the ZB is the 30-year. So one of the things that I want you to have a little perspective of, we're going to cruise over to Tastyworks, we're going to come over here to Futures, we're going to go to Small Exchange. And one of the things I, I will continually point out, if you look at the two-year, okay, the two-year is moving away from the 10-year and the 30-year. And this is where I say there is absolutely some confusion, I would believe, inside of the bond market. Um, the reason I say that there's some confusion, uh, again, as you see, the 10-year, they're going to end the day right around 3.5%. Uh, and listen, the 30-year is sitting at like, you know, 3.573%. But all of a sudden, you have the two-year. The two-year is all the way up to about 4.2%. And I'll tell you what, you could still see the two-year could even hit 5% with the 30-year Okay, and the 10 year staying about 3.5%. So even more divergence is possible and plausible. But as I say, I kind of call that uh, confusion in the uh, confusion trade inside of the bonds because a lot of people don't necessarily understand okay, that rationale. And the rationale is if we're going into recession, those longer duration rates are probably going to come back down. Again, the interest rate will actually come back down. Maybe they've peaked for the time being. Okay, but again, interest rates, and I'll pull up. On think or swim here, the TYX, this is the 30 year. I believe we've probably peaked for the uh, for the time being, meaning we're not going to see another 4.4% inside of TYX. They've probably peaked, maybe they come back up to 4%, but uh, might be over and done with. We might now be pricing in a, uh, a slowdown in the economy where bad news coming out will actually be considered bad news. And I think that's a critical differential for this marketplace because everything prior to this, bad news has been what the S and P is actually rallying because like the Fed's not going to be as hawkish, okay? And there is a distinct change of pace over here. Meanwhile, I say that, but today the bonds did sell off, and again, that's why I kind of call it uh, confusion trade inside of the bonds. The other aspect that everybody keeps asking me about is volatility. So volatility or lack thereof. Listen to me. You don't expect volatility. First of all, you are going into a holiday season. Like this coming week of trade, there's going to be some price action in this coming week of trade unequivocally. And there's, there's capability. You know, does, does Christmas stop the selling? Let me just tell you right now. No, because if you look back to 2018, 2018 was actually big, bad and volatile at that time because of Jerome Powell. We actually had one of the biggest sell offs on Christmas Eve, which was a half a trading session back in 2018. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. But if you're looking for more volatility, why are you looking for more volatility? Look where we have been this year, right? I just want you to actually focus for a second. I'm gonna bring up the 180 day four hour. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna close up this left sidebar. And I want you to see, okay, there. I'm even gonna draw a line exactly where I need it in here. Right there, you guys see it? It's been the central point of trade. So to ask for more volatility or to go like, how come the VIX is going down, man? Doesn't that mean we're bullish? Absolutely unequivocally not. It doesn't mean that we're bullish, okay? Because the volatility is going down. It means that we're, we're comfortable. We've been in this neighborhood before. You know, you walk through a really, really scary place down a really scary alley. First time you walk through that alley, holy crap, and you make it through. The next time you walk through it, you're like, okay, I, I've done this before. By about the 25th time you've walked through the same alley and nothing has happened, guess what? Your volatility level tends to subside. But I remind each and every one of you at the exact same time that I'm saying you walk through that alley and it's not that scary. Well, maybe you should be a little bit more scared because the skew monster is coming back. For those of you that don't understand skew, skew is actually the out of the money put implied volatility okay, versus the out of the money call implied volatility. It's coming back. Now, skew is only calculated towards the end of the day. 
And if you were a complete and total geek, you can just come over here and change it from candle and go to like a line chart or better yet, let's, ooh, let's go to an area chart. This is big and ugly. All right. But look, skew came raging back. So what are they saying? There's hedging going on now. Now there's hedging going on. So you're walking down that, that same alley, but the volatility might be falling, but you have to realize those out of the money puts are getting a little bit pricier versus the out of the money calls. Right. So it's like another way to think about volatility. Volatility in this neighborhood basically says like, hey, I've walked through the neighborhood 25 times, but the neighborhood's getting a little dangerous, if you will, because uh, skew is coming back. As I said a moment ago, you know, does does Christmas, does the holidays, the holidays actually stop the sell side activity? And the answer is no. OK, now I'm actually going to jump ahead for just a second, because when I say that the holidays don't necessarily stop some of the sell side activity. Let's be specific with that. Seven days out, you're looking only at an $87 anticipation of movement. Now, what's crazy about that is if you look, if you look right here today, when I say right here, I'm actually referencing right here. Okay, the range was what, 38.55 to uh, 39.34. You know what the irony is? Okay, you have like an 80 point range in one trading session. They only have priced in for all of next week, $87. So what do you learn about this? And I talked about this last week. I talked about it on Tuesday when I did the video and I'm gonna talk about it today, okay? I'll talk about it at nauseum. I'll drive each and every one of you crazy because you better listen. Short duration, all right? These volatilities just, they don't do it for me. They're not high enough. The, the, cap, the capacity for the marketplace to move $87 unequivocally, right? Again, nothing that's happened, nothing that's transpired is gonna slow down sell side activity just because it's a holiday week. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, most of it's computerized trading anyway. And if you look what just happened at Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs laying up 4,000 people into the holidays, okay? They don't need people. Why feed people when you can just feed a server? And it's sadly, that's that's Wall Street in a nutshell. So um, there's no question that this 3931s are gonna play a critical role. And I wanna make that very, very clear because everybody wants forward looking, right? You wanna know something forward looking? All right. Here's the most forward looking take I can possibly give you. First, let's go back to the 30 day one hour. To the 30 day one hour, you need in this marketplace, you need, if you're bullish, okay, we need to latch on to 39, 31, like it were grim death. I mean, you just, you need to hold this level. If you fall, okay, or stay right now where we are below 39, 31, it's fairly dire. There's an incredibly high probability at this point, we're gonna drop back to the vol box. Okay, for those of you that do not remember the volatility box or what are you new? Okay, maybe you are a little bit newer. The volatility box is right here. And I wanna be incredibly specific with the vol box. Vol box actually ran from basically 3811, okay, right down to about 3600. And yes, there were brief and fleeting moments above it and there were brief and fleeting moments below it. But generally speaking, okay, the volatility box, what did it do? All right, it ran its course, but that volatility box was us pinging back and forth in this 200 point range for a considerable period of time. And oh, was it dangerous. If we just sell off a minimal amount more, we're back in the vol box. And as such, we're gonna test right down into 3,600, right back up to 3,800. There's no question that a breach, a breach, in my opinion, down to 3,800, or like just literally getting under 3,800, boom, we might as well be trading at 3,600. So it'd be a fast and precipitous drop that can actually happen between now and the end of the year. So uh, do not, okay, do not dispel the, uh, the, the myth that uh, that thing has to hold right now, because it doesn't. Okay. Yes, we're very, very close at this point to the 3931. Nevertheless, okay, it's critical, just critical to understand at this point in time how close we are back to the 3931. But falling to 3800 is rather dire for the marketplace. All right, opening up this left side bar. Okay. So a high probability coming back into the volatility box. All right, moving on. As we do each and every week, get your trade on. This week's profits and losses. One of the first things I want to start with is none other than Tesla. Why Tesla? Well, Tesla happens to be part of part of what we term a catapult spread in Tesla. Well, there's 35 days remaining in this particular trade. And what trade is that? Trade that is simply deep in the money. Now, we're not quite closed yet, but this is a $10 wide spread. I'm looking to close the $10 wide spread for about a $7 credit. It's a home run. And I'll tell you why it's a home run. Because we've already closed 
the short put that was financing this particular trade. So what we basically did is we went out and sold S&P puts to actually finance bearish trade inside of Tesla. Tesla was actually the hedge. So not only did we make money in the short puts and already closed those, but we also made money on the Tesla spread, which was inevitably the hedge. All right, next in the docket here, the QQQ. What am I looking at in the QQQ? Okay, this was an intraday trade. Now, everybody always says this. By the way, there's nothing on right now because it's over. It's done with. It's out of here. Okay, what do we do in this trade? We opened a 294 put. It was an intraday basis for $1.27. We closed it for 670. It's a home run. And I got to tell you, that one was, uh, it was nice. I just wish I had, well, more size on. But this is where I like to take shots on an intraday basis. The other aspect that I did is I closed a number, okay, of what we term inflection point spreads. Here's just a, uh, a trade that I closed, a 4,700 call on the, uh, of course, the uh, S&Ps. But I also, in the Theo Theta small portfolio, I closed the entire inventory, okay, for 50% gains through and through. We closed all the calls, okay, the calls include the 4,400 calls closed for over a 50% gain. Those were actually closed for a 60% gain. We actually closed the 4,750 calls for a full game. We also closed the hedge with, okay, a naked short put profitably, mind you, in the midst of uh, all of the chaos, of course, of CPI and the Fed. So again, a really, really strong trading week overall for us. I mean, even today, which was a, uh, a day that I said it was a lot more quiet than I anticipated. So what am I looking for right now? You know, I've got my eye on in a big way over here. Take a look at the spiders. Look at the spiders and go over to a year-to-date percentage. Year-to-date percentage, we're down about 20% in the spiders. One thing that has just really started to bother me, okay, is the fact that the Dow, the Dow is really strong on a relative basis versus the S&Ps. Dow is really strong versus NASDAQ, obviously, and the Russell, okay? And what am I looking for? All right, if you believe in the markets, okay, coming into, you know, fruition a little bit, meaning that the percentage losses, uh, for instance, the S&Ps and the Dow, they're actually going to come together. They're going to converge upon one another, not just into the end of the year, but in the beginning of the uh, of the new year, of course, into January. Uh, I believe that there's going to be great setups, obviously, in the Dow itself. So the Dow itself, there's a couple of different ways you can actually trade Dow, but most of the Dow products are not that liquid. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to look specifically at Dow and Dow-related stocks. Caterpillar. Caterpillar is really, really high on my list. It's up 12% year-to-date basis predicated on what? A slowing economy? Okay, look, have markets actually even priced in a recession? Because if you're stepping back from this and say, oh, no, you're right, the markets probably have not priced in a recession, then a short position in Caterpillar is well warranted. I'm probably going to look for what we term a, uh, a little bit more of a duration, okay? Or I'll actually use Caterpillar in terms of a, um, a catapult spread, okay? I'll also kind of further that with another Boeing trade. Uh, Boeing also, okay, really, really strong relative, really strong relative to the um, to the uh, S&Ps. If you take a look at this in year-to-date basis, Boeing's only down like uh, 11%. In fact, Boeing is right in line with uh, none other than the Dow. Maybe you've got reasons that Caterpillar should be up, okay? But Boeing, again, very, very divergent to the upside after being down as much as, uh, again, almost 50% earlier in the year. Right now, only down 11%. I think Boeing is a, uh, a very critical short. Even if you're bullish on the S&Ps, Okay. It would make sense that Boeing may not progress to the upside, even if the S&Ps did rally, because again, it's the massive outperformer. So new trades and new setups I'm going to be doing this next week here at Theo Trade are going to include a lot of Dow and Dow related stocks, and I'll show you exactly how to set those up. All right, to finish it out, the finale over here. Obviously, we discussed levels 39, 30, uh, 31, and obviously uh, coming under 3,800, might as well be 3,600 in the S&Ps, but the SPX. Again, the SPX just came off of a 127-point move. This next week of trade, we're only expecting about $87 and roughly 70 cents in terms of expected move. I, frankly speaking, do not think that is significant enough. I think that volatility, even into the end of the year, okay, is going to absolutely unequivocally be there. Prepare yourself for it. Because again, I said that this was an opinion piece, and I'm going to give you my opinion. I do not think that markets, okay, are pricing in nearly the type of recession that we're right on the forefront of. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.